trouble home I take In constant sorrow through his day A little bluegrass is good for the soul, I think. We're going to be in Job chapter 11 today. Thank you for praying for us um, during our difficult times and all of that. We appreciate it and we know uh, that prayer matters. And as you prayed for us, we were strengthened. So thank you for that. Uh, Jared did a fine job last week. So we're thankful for that. He uh, stepped right in and, and uh, didn't miss a beat. Um, refresh your memory, two weeks ago, Job had responded to his buddy, Bildad the Brutal, right? He responded that he indeed was guilty, that we are all guilty, right? We are all sinners. He also showed some of his bitterness toward God, and he said, if only I had a mediator, if only I had somebody that could represent me before God, pointing to Christ as the ultimate mediator. Today, we get to another Buddy, if you want to call him that, Zophar, I've turned him Zophar the Zealot, right? Because he has the gift of destructive criticism, right? I mean, don't you just love criticism? I mean, don't you get up in the morning and say, man, I just can't wait till somebody criticizes me. This is going to be a good day, right? I mean, don't we get tired of people saying nice things to us? I mean, really, oh, you just look nice. Please don't tell me that. Don't tell me. I mean, I could use some criticism right now. I mean, we just live in a world, though, that people just want to offer criticism, especially in the world of social media, right? They, you can, uh, I call it, you know, kind of uh, 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 a snipe hunting kind of thing. You're, you're looking for something in everybody that most likely doesn't exist, but you can comment from, from a thousand miles away on a buddy or, or a girlfriend of yours, you know, that you went to high school with, and, and we feel free, right, to, to criticize and to do things in such a way that it's not really for the best. We live in a society now that is volatile. Nobody can disagree civilly anymore, right? If we disagree, we're automatically, you, you know, you unfriend people and, you know, you start talking about each other. And, and this is what, this is not something new. Zophar here has got the spiritual gift of destructive criticism. Now, we need to understand, too, the criticism is not always destructive. Sometimes it's constructive, right? We do need some criticism in our lives, but it needs to be done in the, in the right way. Next week, we're going to look at how Job handles this destructive criticism. It's like the old story. The old man, his the grandfather's taking his grandson to the market, and they've got their donkey. And he starts out, and the grandson is riding the donkey, and the grandfather's walking along with him, and the people passing by are like, oh, I can't believe that. Why would that young man that's healthy make the granddad walk? So they switch places. So granddad gets up on the donkey, and the, the young man is is uh, walking alongside, and so somebody says, walks along, and says, oh man, how can you, the granddad's making his grandson walk all that way. So they both get up on the donkey. Soon they pass some other people, and they're like, oh my gosh, those two people riding that donkey, poor donkey. I mean, I can't believe they're doing that to that donkey. So they get down off the donkey, and they're both walking along, and then a crowd comes by, and they says, I can't believe they're not using a perfectly good donkey. What's wrong with those people? You know, no matter what you do, we're going to get criticism, right? Sometimes it's deserved, sometimes it's not. But what we are going to see today is not something we want to be a part of, and especially as Christians in a world that they, the only things that people advertise in the media about Christians is that we're mean and evil and, and all that stuff. We have no love and, you know, we're just against everything, right? Right? That's what we're portrayed in the media today. You hardly see the stories of all the great things that people are doing. But you see here, we don't want to be a part of this, right? We don't want to be somebody who is a destructive critic, if you will. Join me. We're going to read Job chapter 11. Then we're going to dig into it. Then Zophar the Namathite replied, 
Should this stream of words go answered and such a talker be acquitted? Should your babbling put others to silence so that you can keep on ridiculing with no one to humiliate you? You have said, my teaching is sound and I am pure in your sight. Oh, but if only God would speak and declare his case against you, he would show you the secrets of wisdom, for true wisdom has two sides. Know then that God has chosen to overlook some of your sins. Can you fathom the depths of God or discover the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. If he passes by and throws someone into prison or convenes a court, who can stop him? Surely he knows which people are worthless. If he sees iniquity, will he not take note of it? But a stupid man will gain understanding as soon as a wild donkey is born a man. Now that's a scripture to memorize right there. <laughs> as for you, if you to redirect your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer, if there is iniquity in your hand, remove it. And don't allow injustice to dwell in your tents. Then you will hold your head high, free from fault. You will be firmly established and unafraid. For you will forget your suffering, recalling it only as waters that have flowed by. Your life will be brighter than noonday. Its darkness will be like the morning. You will be confident because there is hope. You will look carefully about and lie down in safety. You will lie down without fear. And many will seek your favor. But the sight of the wicked will fail. Their way of escape will be cut off. And their only hope is their last breath. Man, anybody got a friend like Zophar? Anybody got a friend named Zophar? <laughs> I mean, you'd win the prize for sure. This is not the kind of friend that we, we want to have. We have seen... The previous two friends that had come a long way, now let's, you know, recap what Job has gone through. Job has lost everything. First, all of his children were killed, and then he's lost his, all of his herds, he's lost all of his crops, he's lost everything. Now, he's afflicted with a disease where he has to sit outside of the city, and he has boils that he scrapes with pottery just to give himself some comfort. And this guy, all of his friends are telling Job that, Job, all of this is happening to you, not because you're a righteous person, but because you're rotten. You've got some secret sin that you've not let anybody know about. You are an awful person, and all of this is happening to you because you're an awful person. Right? Have you ever gone through something and one of your friends says, what have you done? What have you done? To deserve all this. We'll understand that's not exactly how God works at all times. Sometimes we go through troubles because we deserve it. Sometimes we go through troubles to, for the Lord testing us and strengthening us. Right here, Job is, is a righteous man. The whole first and second chapters talk about his righteousness. But we want to look here at Zophar and his destructive criticism. His destructive criticism starts with insults. Right? Zophar is offended, I think, by Job's speech as he was talking about he is still righteous before the Lord. He has not done anything wrong, and this has all happened because God is mad at me. And Zophar is offended. He begins by just calling him out. Should the streams of words go unanswered and such a talker be acquitted? Now that's kind of interesting, a talker there. The word in the original language is a man of lips. A man of lips. Your lips are always going. Right? He said, should, should all your words not be confronted? Because you're an idiot. You just keep talking and talking and talking and somebody's got to confront you. I mean, all these words, he goes on, he says, you're just babbling. All these words that you're saying make no sense. You're blaming God for all these things. He's done nothing. You deserve it. You see, he's trying to get at him, and he starts with insults. He says, no one is there to humiliate you. You say that you're a righteous person? Oh, if only God would get after you. You would know what a righteous person looks like. He is mocking Job. 
right? He's a babbler, he's a man of lips, he's a talker and all these things, but there's no way that they have any idea that Zophar is giving Job any credit for actually telling the truth. He just wants to insult him, right? We have to see when we criticize somebody or we receive criticism, insults should not be a part of it whatsoever. Right? You should never start the sentence with, man, you're an idiot. Did you know what you were doing? I mean, you have no brain in your head. I mean, that is not a good way to start a conversation with people. Just telling you. Especially online. If you ever type those words to somebody, shame on you. You see, we have to be above everything that, that Zophar is going for here. He is trying to, to get Job because Job is questioning God and he's offended and he starts with just sheer insults. He appointed himself as one to rebuke Job. Unfortunately, there are people in our world, you have probably in your circle or, or my circle, these people that have appointed themselves, the arbiter of that is good and right. And everything that falls outside of their standards, now understand their standards, right? You're going to hear about it. You have those people in your life, right? You don't do it exactly their way or you don't do it this way and you are automatically just off, off their list, right? Because you have done nothing right and you can't do things right according to their standards. And that's the way Zophar is. He's the friend that can never be satisfied. Right? He's the person that is always willing to, to take you at your lowest and take you lower. Right? You've obviously done something wrong. It's because you're a low-down, dirty dog. Right? And, and we've, we have to deal with those people. Right? How do we deal with them? Well, you don't turn it around and insult them too. Job's going to give us a, a recipe next week on how to deal with Zophar because we all have a Zophar somehow in our lives. He makes it very personal here too. Right? He says, how, could, how would God charge you. He said, if he spoke and declares his case against you, he would show you the secrets of his wisdom. And true wisdom has two sides. He's saying, you don't even, God has two sides of wisdom and you can't even figure out either one of them. Right? God has an idea of what everything should be and you can't even figure out what God's thinking. And then he takes it even further. Know then that God has chosen to overlook some of your sins. He's saying, whatever you have done, Job, it's probably far worse than what God is putting in your life. He's saying that God isn't even treating you like you deserve, which is true. Scripture, scripture tells us clearly that God does not treat us as our sins deserve. But he's not saying that in a good way. He's saying, Job, you're a low-down, dirty dog, and you're not even getting treated as badly by God as you should. He is trying to take him down to the lowest of the low. Now understand, this is not the way to confront a friend. Know this. When you're talking to somebody and you begin the insults or turn it around, they begin insulting you. Understand that the conversation stops at that point. When you're insulted, boom, the walls go up. There's no more communication going through that wall any longer. Right? If you're insulting someone, they are, are the ones that are not listening to you anymore. After you say, you're an idiot, everything after that is just Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. If you want to get your point across with somebody, if you want to speak to somebody that, that really needs some kind of constructive criticism, do not start with insults. Funny story I read, Sports Illustrated one day, Wade Boggs used to play third base for the Boston Red Sox. Very good, very good player. But he hated to go to New York because the Yankees had a guy that had a box that sat behind 
his dugout right there by the on-deck circle. And every time Boston would come to town, this guy showed up every game. Even in pregame warm-ups, this guy was on Wade Boggs, yelling and screaming at him. I mean, he was cussing at him, every obscenity known to man. And it just got under Boggs' skin. Years upon years upon years upon years. This guy sat in this box, and he constantly insulted Wade Boggs, and he hated going to New York. Wade, one day, had been going through his pregame warm-ups, and this guy was just already just wearing him out. This guy showed up early just to start wearing him out for pregame. And so, he's just yelling and screaming at him, and Boggs has had enough of it. And he walks over to the guy, and he says, are you the guy that's been insulting me all these years? He says, yeah, I am. What are you going to do about it? Boggs reaches in his back pocket and gets a baseball, signs his name on it, tosses it to the guy. Boggs said that his eyes were as big as plates. The guy said, I thought he was going to throw it at me. He said, but you know what? After he gave him that ball, the next day, that man didn't say a word to him. Didn't say a word. He said, actually, that man became one of his biggest fans. He switched the next home series, the next series that they played in New York, the guy didn't sit there and, and yell and scream and curse at him. The guy actually encouraged him. Way to go, Boggs! He turned that man's insults completely around. So understand, you cannot communicate with insults. And if somebody insults you, turn it around on them. Turn it around on them. Zophar goes on, and then he tries to try intimidation. Intimidation. He goes here, and he says, beginning in verse 7, Can you fathom the depths of God or discover the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. It's quite interesting what he's saying here. He's like, can you understand any of this? He's making the point to Job that Job doesn't have the capacity to understand God. And he's beating him over the head. He's trying to intimidate him with God and lack of knowledge about God. But the interesting thing here, Zophar is claiming that he knows all these things about God. Isn't that interesting? Zophar is a prototypical, self-righteous Pharisee who uses God as a club instead of using God as love and kindness and truth and justice. We know those people. I've had them in my life. Before I came to Christ, before I began walking with Christ, I had friends that went to church all the time. And they'd always tell me, oh, Dal, you need, to, you need to get in church because you're going to die living the way you're doing. And they'd always beat me over the head with the Bible, right? I mean, they were on me, and it just pushed me away, right? The way they used God as a club, right? They didn't portray God to me as a God that loved me and cared for me, loved me so much that he gave his son to, to take care of all my sins so that we can be in a relationship and I can learn from God and he can, he, he can take care of me and watch over me. He didn't present that at all. He said God was a judge that was going to kill me because of the way I was living. That's the way, unfortunately, most people present God. If they're self-righteous, people that don't have a good relationship with the Lord in the first place, because that's the problem, right? If you don't have a good relationship with the Lord in the first place, and you don't understand his love and his care and all of that, then you might see God as just an angry judge sitting at the bench, ready to dole out punishment for those people who don't meet his standard. And that's much different than the picture that God gives us in Scripture. Zophar is trying to beat Job over the head with God. He's trying to shame him. All these things that you've said about being righteous, you don't even know what he thinks. Ha <laughs> ha, but I, Zophar, I know exactly what he thinks. You see, people like that do a 
a detriment to the cause of Christ as opposed to bringing anybody closer to Christ. Let me just tell you, if you are trying to win somebody to Christ that is lost, that doesn't know the Lord, beating them over the head with God will not do it. Insulting them definitely won't do it. Here, Zophar is trying to just beat him to death. He goes on. He says, if he passes by and throws someone in prison or convenes a court, who can stop him? Well, that's true. I mean, that's true in a way. He's not giving God credit for his justice here. He's just saying he would do it randomly to whoever he wants to. And in verse 11, he says something here that he needs to be called upon himself. He says, surely he knows which people are worthless. If he sees iniquity, will he not take care of it? Now, he's accusing Job here of being deceitful. He's saying, Job, you're not being honest with me, but God knows. God knows how you're living. God knows that you're unrighteous. God knows that, that you're, you're just getting what you deserve. But look what he says here. He says, he knows which people are worthless worthless. Now that's a strong word. Okay. This word here, worthless, it has the idea that there is no value to the person whatsoever. Okay. They have no value to, to earth, to, to people, to society, that they are just taking up space. They are a wasted allocation of skin. Let's understand something. There is no one that is worthless. No one. We, we understand from Genesis, we are made in the image and the likeness of God. God don't make no junk. Right? And there is no one that is worthless. People, every people, deserves respect and love and kindness. Even if you don't agree with them. There is not a worthless person that has been born in history. Now... Unfortunately, many people take their worth and they, they project their worth and they think other people are only worthy or, or of any value by what they can offer society. Let me tell you today, homeless people are just as worthy to God than anybody else. Terrorists have worth before God. You see, the problem is we all have a little Pharisee in us. Right? I mean, we don't like people because they do this or they don't think this way or they think that way. We are basically telling them they are not as worthy as we are. Now, let me get this across. If you do not tell people about Christ, right, if we're not sharing the gospel with people around us, we are essentially saying they are not worthy of the gospel. How awful. If there's anybody that we would think is worthless, we don't get and understand the gospel. We were made by God. And we were saved by God's death on the cross through Jesus. That indeed right there makes us worthy. And have worth because what Christ did. Zophar doesn't get it. He is holier thou. He, he is self-righteous. Now, these, I want to give you some characteristics of self-righteousness because we often miss them because we fit a lot of these characteristics. Self-righteous people often, number one, love to talk more than they do listen. Do you... Find yourself, when you're talking to people, you're doing all the talking and they're just nodding. Or maybe you've got a friend like that. You've got a friend that they just talk, 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 and you're just like, yeah. That's not a good thing, people. It's not a good thing. I know you've got to get your words out. But sometimes you can overwhelm people with words. 
Another thing is, self-righteous people love to offer advice before it's asked for. Well, if that was me. You ever have those friends? You might be that friend, right? Another thing is they judge others more than they uplift others. They find faults with others more than magnify their strengths. They rebuke others rather than encouraging them. Here's one of the kickers. They believe their knowledge and insight is superior to those other people. They consider the lives of some people more valuable than others. You might be a Pharisee if you fit any of these characteristics. Unfortunately, many people think that criticism is a spiritual gift, and it's not. I would love to wake up one day and get on Facebook or, or, or Twitter or whatever and have just people saying, man, you know, I don't agree with you, but you're a great person. We believe completely opposite of everything, but you know what? I like you. I think your hair's nice. I mean, you, you, you dress really good. I mean, you're raising a good family. You know, I would love to see just a, a whole wave of people actually saying nice things to people and encouraging one another as opposed to picking apart the smallest detail of what's wrong with us. What would change in our world if that were the case? I mean, just imagine. Just imagine if you just got online today. When you, when you leave church, you know, hopefully you're going to treat your mama nice anyway. Hopefully it's not just on Mother's Day. But what would happen if this afternoon you just got on, on, on Facebook, whatever you use, and actually go on there and encourage people and just say something nice to them? That would change the way things work, especially in the relationships with other people. We don't need to be people that are always trying to intimidate people with God. There was a great story the other day. There was a Jewish rabbi. During the time Russia was in the throes of communism, this rabbi was in and out of jail all the time because he refused to give up his belief in God. Well, there was one time that he was out and he was, he was praying in the synagogue. And here comes the police. They come in. They take him down to the police station. They work him over. They beat him up. They do all kinds of things to him. And they put him in a room. And after a few hours, the interrogator comes in. And he tells him, you give up your belief in God or we're going to kill you. And he pulls out his gun. And he said, this is my little intimidator. He said, many a man have changed their beliefs because of this little intimidator. The rabbi, without missing a beat, says, your little intimidator can only intimidate the kind of man who has many gods but one world. He said, you cannot intimidate me because I have one God and two worlds. They ended up not killing him that day. Years later, they did finally kill him because he refused to give up his belief in God. Intimidation never works. Never works. The last thing we're going to see with Zophar here is pessimism. For all of you people that have the gift of pessimism, let's talk. Here, he's trying in the next verses, 13 through 20, he... He's trying to get Job to say, okay, we're just buddies here, okay? You can go ahead and confess everything that you've got. Okay, I mean, we're just friends. I know that you've done something awful because all these things have happened to you. So just get it off your chest, okay? Why don't you just start, why don't you just start with me, okay? Just come on, just between me and you, just repent of all of the things that you have done. All right, pessimism always takes the approach of guilty until proven innocent. Right, that's pessimism. Right, if something bad is going to happen, it's going to happen. 
Okay, everything can be great, but you know what? Everything has not got a silver lining. It's got a black lining around it. Okay, it is same, things are pretty good right now, but guess what? Something's going to happen. Okay, are you one of those people? I mean, I, a lot of people say, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. But is that the case? If we're looking for bad things to happen, then guess what? I think we're a pessimist. If we take life as it comes, and we don't have these high expectations of, of perfection in every sense of the word, then we are realists. But here, Zophar is full of pessimism that he is walking Job through what it means if he will repent. Okay, he's telling him here, first of all, if you would repent, you'd be made spotless, free of guilt. Right, and that's true. He goes on, he said, you'll be made strong and fearless. Verse 15. Then he goes on, verse 16. You will forget all of your suffering and it will go like waters gone by. He's outlining all these things. He'll be given security and hope. Verse 18, you'll look carefully about and lie down in safety. You're going to even help people and be called in for counsel. Now understand what he's saying here. He's saying, Job, this is for you. Jesus answered this when before in the New Testament he says, be careful, because when you point out the speck in somebody else's eye, there's a plank in your own. John chapter 8, the Pharisees bring this woman out that had been caught in the midst of adultery. What are you going to do with her, Jesus? Are you going to kill her? Jesus leans down and he writes something in the dirt. And he looks up. And he says, all right, the person without the sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. As the men begin thinking about what he said, they begin to drop their stones and walk away. Before you know it, they look up and none of the men are there. And that woman is still there. Now understand, Jesus is not letting her off the hook because he says, woman, go and sin no more. This is an adulteress, been caught in the middle of adultery. What did he say? Go and sin no more. We have to be careful when we're pessimistic with everything because we're putting ourselves above the other people. Pessimism on our part hinders the grace of God in our own life and in the lives of everybody else. Okay, because pessimism is the idea that the Pharisees loved. If you can just say everything is perfect then that's good, but they love to, to add to the, the weight of everybody's back. That's what Jesus said. You Pharisees, y'all add weight upon weight upon weight upon these people through the laws that they can't bear. How should we as the people of God look so pessimistically on people and upon their situations, upon their lives? How can we look at them and pass judgment from our high holy seat of self-righteousness and think that anything we can say could help them? Zophar was a pessimist, above pessimists. It was Job's problem to repent. I'm sitting here before you. I am perfect. Job, you're the one that needs to repent. The two men are praying in the temple. The publican is in the back of the temple and he's on his knees crying out to God. Oh God, forgive me. 
God, I am an unworthy sinner. And the Pharisee stands next to him and he says, God, thank you that I'm not like this guy. In our pessimism, we are essentially standing there saying, God, thank you that I'm not like this person. We have to be careful how we talk to people, how we deal with them. Great story. There was an optimistic farmer. He couldn't wait to wake up in the morning because he would start out the day, good morning, God. But he had a neighbor that was just the opposite. She would say, good God, it's morning. He tried his best all the time to try to get her to see the bright side of things. When he saw opportunities, she saw problems. They were outside one time. He says, oh, look at that beautiful sky. Did you see the glorious sunrise? She said, yep. It'll probably get so hot that the crops are going to scorch. One time it rained. He says, oh, look at that. God's given the corn a drink of water. She said, yep, but if it keeps raining, it's going to flood everything and ruin everything. It went back and forth every day, every day. So finally, he's thinking he had this opportunity and he buys this miraculous dog, right? And this miraculous dog could do all kinds of tricks. And so he asks her over and says, watch this. And so he throws the ball out in the pond and the dog runs across the top of the water, gets the ball and comes back. He says, what do you think about that? She said, your dog can't swim, can he? (laughs) Just as optimism and pessimism are dramatically opposite, oil and water, destructive criticism and godliness do not mix. Do not mix. If you want to walk with God, you want to avoid these three things that Zophar is so good at. He's full of insults. This man loves to call names. He loves to point out his his superiority over everybody. He, He loves to use God to intimidate people. And he's a dyed in the wool pessimist. Now, I'm not telling you that everything's great and everything should be sunshiny, and I'm not telling you that. What I'm saying is that we don't always have to have an attitude that everything's awful. If God is on his throne and we are his kids, guess what? We got a chance. We got a chance. Even in the midst of hardship, God is with you. Let me tell you something, though. If you don't know Christ, your hardship can only get worse because you're without somebody. You're without a mediator to take care of you, to intercede before God for you. I don't understand the things that Charlotte's been going through with her health and us, and the loss of her sister and all of these things. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, how could people without Christ, how do they deal with those things? I mean, I I couldn't imagine not being able to pray to our Heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us. And He does ease our burdens. He does walk with us and grieve with us. He does care for us, hold us. He does strengthen us in our weakness. But you see, if you don't know Christ, if you have no relationship with the Father, if you've never repented of your sins, then guess what? You're responsible for doing all that yourself, and you can't because you're weak, just like the rest of us. If you don't know Christ today, I invite you to come to know him. The truth of the matter is this, Christ, the very Son of God, perfect and holy in every way. He took a beating that we deserve for our sins, and then they hung him on a cross. 
As he hung upon the cross, the Father put every sin, past, present, and future, upon his shoulders. Sins that we have committed and will commit. And Christ paid the price for us. He took the wrath of God because God is a perfect and holy and righteous judge. He died and he was put in a borrowed tomb and on the third day he was resurrected to life. He's still alive today. Scripture tells us that what do we do? We just, we have to get our lives cleaned up before we come to Christ, right? No, it's not what Scripture tells us. You have to go and do all these great things and you have to make up for all the bad things that you've done and then you can come to Christ. No, it's not what it says. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to do any special things. You don't have to go to church 1,700 times and read your Bible every day. You don't have, that's not what saves you. It's Jesus. It's by grace that we are saved. Today, if you don't know Christ, I invite you. What a great day it would be to put your faith in Christ. If you're a believer today, you've already put your faith in the Lord, but you, sometimes we get in a ditch, don't we? We get in a negative mindset, we get into an idea that everything's wrong, and we, and we love to spread the misery, don't we? Today, maybe you need to ask the Lord to forgive you for some of the things that you've said or didn't say, or maybe you've not been as comforting to people as you should. Some, whatever it is, the Lord will tell us. Whatever it is. During our invitation, you're going to have the opportunity to come. We'll lead you to the Lord if you don't know him. We will pray for you. We will do all we can for you. But it takes you stepping out. It takes you making that decision. We can't make that decision for you. God brought you here for a reason. He's given this message to us because we all need it. We're all imperfect. You could criticize me all day long and I deserve it. But you see, Christ paid the price for our sins. We are all imperfect people, but we have a perfect risen Savior. Let's pray together. Father, you are good. You are gracious and kind. You are far better to us than we deserve. Lord, you are generous. Father, you do want us to improve. You do, Lord, tell us those things are wrong because we're human. Lord, you don't want us to stay the way we are. Lord, I ask today, Lord, if there is one here that's lost, that you will save them. One that doesn't have a relationship with the one true God, Father, I ask that you save them today. Father, help us that are believers to improve upon things because, oh, Father, we need you every day. Lord, take this time. Use us. Change us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.